Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about post-Brexit trade with non-EU markets, brought to you by the Institute of Exports and International Trade. My name is William Barnes-Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute of Exports, and I will be your host for this afternoon. And thank you all for joining us. We have uh, already a couple hundred who have already joined, and I know we have more to join as well. We've had lots of sign-ups today, so a warm welcome to everyone today. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, well, uh, uh, three great speakers today, in fact. So to begin with, we have Amy Maltzman back again from the Institute of Export. Hi, Amy, how are you? Hi, Will, I'm very well, glad to be here. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm yeah, glad, glad to have you here. And we also have a debut today from another Institute Customs Consultant in Jimena Florian. Hi, Jimena, I hope I said that correctly. How are you today? Remember to unmute. Hello, yeah. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Fantastic. And we also have a return for a regular on the platform in Yvonne Redor Anderson, the Head of Export Finance at Pippi Financial Services. Hi, Yvonne. Great to have you here again. How are you? Hi, Will. I'm fine, thanks, and good to be here again. Fantastic. And thank you once again to Bibi for partnering with us for today's webinar. And I look forward to hearing more about Bibi's latest research into market trends and some of the support that is available to traders, particularly around export finance. Before handing over to Yvonne, though, I'd like to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So the first poll we're asking today is asking... How have or how have you changed your plans for exporting post Brexit? The options there are the plans are still the same. You've completely refocused to other countries, or you've adjusted slightly, shifting focus from the EU to to other markets. So I'll just leave that poll to one for a few seconds. Um, but while you're answering that, a couple of housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel to the control window to the right hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions to, towards the end of the webinar and uh, between the presentations, but please do bear in mind we have received a lot of questions in advance, so we'll not be able to get to all of your queries today. If you feel as though your question has not been answered, please do review the Institute's technical help helpline, its training and consultancy offerings, which we'll be talking about later in the webinar. Secondly, you will be receiving access to today's slide pack and recording of the webinar uh, in a follow-up email. So please do uh, try to listen in as carefully as you can to the presentation and answers uh, today. Anyway, I shall quickly now close that poll. It's going to share the results. So this is quite interesting, actually. So 70% have said that your plans are still the same. 4% uh, are saying that you've completely refocused, but there's 26% of you uh, about uh, over a quarter who've adjusted slightly. So um, maybe slightly more the same than I would have expected, but uh, interesting findings anyway. Thank you everyone for answering that poll. And now to uh, talk about uh, some, some of the market, latest market trends and um, talk a bit more about some of the challenges which exporters are facing in non-EU markets. Over to you, Yvonne. Thanks, Will. I know we've got a, a relatively short amount of time, so I'll start with the briefest of overviews of who Bibi Financial Services are. I'll let you read the slide. I'm head of our Export Finance Business Centre, a team totally committed to funding export receivables to harness our clients' growth potential both at home and overseas. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. So what's happened since January the 1st? Exports into our old EU partners has fallen, as you can see. No surprises, uncertainty to what a post-Brexit supply chain will look like, uh, uncertainty around the movement of freight, and continued lockdown scenarios around the globe are all con contributing factors. Some of our clients have mothballed their export business and are refocusing on the UK, and some remain unaffected. If I take online clothing and leisure goods, for example, they've thrived. Services within the EU have struggled. Services outside the EU 
have grown. It's been a mixed bag. And many of our clients are looking to new markets outside of the EU. So next slide. A look at the UK's top uh, non-EU market destinations. So the USA was then, is now. The UK's number one export market. In 2019, the UK exported around 63.2 billion of goods, vehicles, machinery, pharmaceutical products, snack foods, food and drink generally. Services also played a part, financial and other professional and management services. If we move on to Singapore, our trade agreement with Singapore is seen as a supply chain gateway to the other Southeast Asian markets, which includes China. Singapore has an open economy and is highly dependent on international trade, boosting its status as a re-export and transshipment center. The larger of the UK re-exports being machinery, mechanical appliances to other Southeast Asian markets, not China, but the opportunity of China through this link shouldn't be ignored. The UK is pressing hard for trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand, from which UK exporters will benefit from cheaper tariffs. The, Jap the Japanese signed a trade deal with the UK back in October, creating tariff-free opportunities for both markets. And I know that uh, tariffs are going to be touched on later on. Next slide. So if we have a look at the top markets that our clients are successfully growing beneficial export opportunities, I'll run over just a few of these. So the UAE, that's for both goods and services. The oil and gas sector are picking up on our technical knowledge in this area with clients providing skilled technicians. Machine parts, again, in particular to the oil and gas sector. Outdoor leisure goods have seen a huge hike in sales opportunities. In Switzerland, we're looking at bespoke goods, high quality lifestyle goods. Our trade agreement with Switzerland doesn't include services, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. In fact, we see a strong link in financial and business services being provided by our clients. India is upcoming. It's a broad brush for our clients. Machinery of all kinds and food and drink of all types. Notwithstanding COVID, the aviation sector, both for parts and services, also playing a part here. Next slide. So let's have a look at the risks. I might tie two in together here, political and economic risk and bad debts. Three things that can be mitigated with trade credit insurance, which also brings in legislation and legal jurisdiction. And we urge our clients to think about what might happen if you don't have these in check. Think protracted and expensive legal costs. If you're operating under the terms and conditions of your buyer under their local laws, in a worst case scenario, court action may need translation of all documentation and correspondence into the local language by an authorized translator, even if they do speak English. A translator with you in court, costs of attending, flights, hotel, these are all considerations which added together will come off your bottom line. So get covered, get protracted default and customer failure cover. Ensure political and economic risk cover is included and get legal costs included as well. And think about extended payment terms. If you haven't planned for this, it's gonna hit your cash flow. Goods on the water to Southeast Asia can take a good three weeks, unlike a courier from London to Birmingham. To be competitive in the local market, your customer will also want credit terms once they have the goods. So you might be asked to extend terms out to 75 days plus. 
And how are you going to fund your business with extended terms stretching your cash flow? We know there's cheap government schemes in the marketplace now, yet these aren't long-term solutions. And maybe invoice finance can be a good alternative to more traditional and restrictive bank solutions. And what currencies are you dealing in? GBP, USD or the Euro? You'll be converting at spot or taking forward contracts. Think about the advantages and also the risks. Of course, all of these risks exist for markets closer to home, but the further afield, the less control you'll have. There's no doubting that challenges can exist and each needs careful consideration and often none more so than the contract itself. Next slide. What I would say here is beware of the battle of the paperwork. Chasing new orders in new markets, our clients find that most likely they will have to sign the terms and conditions and accept the terms of the PO as provided by the buyer. And from the get go, we know that 99% of the time, the applicable law under which you will then trade will be that of the buyer. The potential clauses noted here aren't exhausted, but look closely for things like warranties and guarantees you're being asked to provide, terms of payment, inco terms, have you priced your products accordingly? What happens if a dispute occurs? Are there penalties for late delivery? Services, what happens if the job doesn't complete on time? This is an actual occurrence which I share with clients from time to time. So a client of ours with a contract to supply telecom technicians into a global brand exporting finished product from China is involved here. The contract and the value of money for which the contract couldn't exceed expired, but the job wasn't finished. A manager on site confirmed by email that the contractor should remain on site until the job was finished. That manager was not an authorized signature of the customer. That manager left his job. And when it came to payment, the customer said, not paying. The contact wasn't, the contract rather, wasn't extended. Such was the global name of the buyer that they settled through arbitration, but not before our client's business failed and stripped him of any reserves held in that business. So please read over contracts carefully and make sure both parties sign. Actually, you'll be amazed at how many contracts I see from our clients that are either signed incorrectly, signed by just one of the parties, even not signed at all and not dated, and of equal concern, exporters that don't have their own terms and conditions of sale where you can make your rights and your terms of sale prevail. Lay out what you will offer and what you'll expect in return. At present, where businesses are exporting for the first time, I probably see one in five who don't believe they need to have terms of sale. So please don't make that mistake. Next slide. And our last slide. So I told you a little bit very quickly in the beginning about who uh, BFS are, uh, that we look to support UK exports. So finally, how do we do that? So you invoice your customer, you send a copy to us. We pay you typically up to 85% of the value of your export invoice. When the invoice is due, we collect the payment and pay you the remaining balance. Invoice finance can be disclosed or undisclosed. We have a product that allows you to continue to carry out your own collection activity. And of course, I'll admit at this point in time that there are other invoice finances in the marketplace as well. And with that, I'm gonna hand back to you, Will. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, as ever, a really interesting uh, oversight into some of the trends which Bibi is seeing, but also some really useful tips, uh, particularly around contracts, I thought, and some an interesting kind of insight into invoice financing as well there. But uh, if I quickly share 
uh, another poll uh, and we'll do another, we'll do a question during the poll, but um, the question is, where do you see the greatest opportunities uh, post Brexit? Um, we've had a few questions come through already. The first one I'm going to do is from Martin. It actually follows up on one of your last points. So Martin says his firm has tried invoice, invoice financing. They can mm -hmm. only get 30% of the invoice value of the customers overseas. What do you at Bibi offer? But as I just mentioned, Will, we'll offer up to usually 85% of the value of the invoice. Uh, there will, will be some caveats to that. It'll de depend on the market that's being exported to. It'll depend on uh, the trade sector that maybe the client is selling into. We will take some security from the client. But invariably, we will look to pay as much as we possibly can. We certainly don't have a cap where we would say, for example, domestic debt, we'll fund that at 80, 85, even 90 percent, but uh, export business only 30 percent. And I know that is uh, something that's uh, prevalent out in the marketplace. But as I mentioned, um, I'm head of our export finance um, team, and we are a team that are that are experts and, and solely really concentrating on, on supplying as much finance as possible to exporters. Okay, very interesting. And um, we've had another question come through from Chris, who's asked, um, who's asked around what scope do you see for exports to Africa and Southeast Asia? I'd just be interested to see what, what are the trends you've seen in those markets in particular and kind of what are the, the main risks mm -hmm. for exporters to be aware of? Yeah, not so much Africa. Um, and Africa in itself is a difficult market. There are several what we would call higher risk markets that are difficult to fund because it's difficult to obtain trade credit insurance. Within the invoice finance industry, we tend to call that bad debt protection. Uh, and if we can't get bad debt protection on those particular markets or customers in those markets, it does make it slightly more difficult to fund um, in terms of Southeast Asia, that's certainly an up and coming market. And we've seen that actually before Brexit as well. Markets such as Singapore that I've mentioned already, Japan, some exports into Thailand, for example, Korea, South Korea, um, oil and gas industry in particular. It's not mentioned in your question, but South America is also an upcoming market again in, in terms of the oil and gas industry most definitely so that's where our clients that are in the service industry um, are able to put qualified technicians into place that's really interesting particularly around southeast asia because obviously there's uh, all the talk about the uk pivoting to the pacific and obviously we'll, we'll see when and how quickly that happens and uh, whether that will create the opportunities the government hopes it does yeah. but, uh, Plenty, plenty to look into, Absolutely. I suppose. And just to share the results of that poll, which again, are, as ever, really interesting. Um, so a third of people on the line have said Asia, I and mean, obviously Asia is a big place that could encapsulate uh, the Far East, the Southeast Asia, the subcontinent, or uh, even the Middle East. Um, so maybe not too surprising, but more more Asia than the EU, interestingly enough, of course, we're saying the EU, uh, fifth North America. Uh, not so many Australia and New Zealand, they are quite far away, of course, and 17% uh, potentially between uh, Africa and Latin America. Any surprises there, Bond? Does that kind of tally with uh, what you've been seeing? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, I'm not surprised to see Asia up there in front at all, really. Really interesting. It's uh, the Asian uh, century, isn't it, is what they call it. But um, thank you, Yvonne. As ever, that's a fantastic presentation. Thank you for the answers so far. We'll be coming back to more questions later on. Um, and thank you, everyone, for answering that poll. But if we move on to the next part of the presentation, I'd like to now hand over to Amy, a customs consultant at the Institute of Export, to talk about um, trade agreements and uh, the rules of origin in trade agreements. So over to you, Amy. Thank you, Will. Everyone's favourite topic, rules of origin. It's my delight to present that to you today. So um, starting off with the definition of a trade agreement. So a trade is a pact um, by two or more countries and that e the, the aim is to reduce restrictions on imports and encourage exports between the countries. I mean, the countries who sign an agreement are called cooperating states. 
Um, a bilateral free trade agreement is a an agreement between two states, so for example, the UK and Turkey agreement, um, and a multilateral agreement um, is between three or more states. An example of that would be the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. Um, and it's really important to note that free trade agreements do not remove the need for customs declarations, so goods still need to be imported and exported, but the free trade agreement reduces or eliminates tariffs payable on goods. Next slide, please. So moving on to look at the UK's free trade agreements. So as you can see, the UK has signed agreements with many parties already um, and as an independent state, and engagement is ongoing with many more. Um, and because the UK has left the EU, the UK um, traders no longer have access to EU free trade agreements. Um, and the UK sought to reproduce the effect of, of trade agreements that previously applied to ensure continuity of trade for UK businesses. Um, and we know um, one of the most famous ones so far this year, um, the UK has signed a trade and cooperation agreement with the EU and that totally eliminates tariffs on goods as long as goods meet the rules of origin and comply with other conditions that we'll talk about today. The UK has also signed an agreement with Turkey um, and it's worth noting that prior to leaving um, the EU, the UK had access to the EU-Turkey Customs Union. Um, so under a customs union and for goods moving between Turkey and the UK, goods needed to be in free circulation, okay? duty needed to be paid and if that happened, nil tariffs applied. Um, but now that there's a free trade agreement in place, goods need to meet rules of origin and other conditions in, other, in order to qualify for those preferential tariffs. So it's really important that businesses understand that. Um, and some of the arrangements, for example, or sorry, some of the agreements, for example, Canada, they're not yet legally in effect, but preferential tariff rates are still being applied. Um, and that's so that traders can still avail of those, those lower or nil rates of tariffs. Um, and it's important to note that um, due to the government's desire to ensure continuity of trade, many of the UK agreements with third countries allow EU materials to be considered originating for the purposes of qualifying goods under an agreement. Um, and a provision, that provision is known as accumulation. So some agreements also allow for parts to, from other countries as well, places like Switzerland, Iceland, Norway and Turkey to be considered as originating. Um, but the really important note um, on that is that in order for accumulation to apply, the operations undertaken in the UK must go beyond minimal operations. Um, and it's really important to check the text of each agreement individually. I mean, the UK has also implemented its own independent generalised scheme of preferences, as you'll see on the screen, in which allows goods coming from least developed countries to benefit from lower or nil rates of duty on import into Great Britain, as long as they meet rules of origin. Um, and the, the scheme is unilateral, which means the, the tariff applies on goods entering Great Britain, but not on import into those least developed countries. Um, and I'll include a link to um, the information on each of these agreements at the very end. Next slide, please, Will. So how do tariffs work? Um, in the absence of a free trade agreement, the World Trade Organization rules dictate that the same duty rates must be applied to the same goods coming from third, all third countries in order to prevent discrimination. And this is known as the Most Favoured Nation Principle, or MFM. And free trade agreements reduce or eliminate MFN tariffs. So where there's a free trade agreement in place, non-members of the agreement could try to move their goods through an FTA member state. So in this example, through member state two, in order to try and avoid MFN tariffs. Um, and this does a good job of demonstrating why there's a need for rules to identify origin of goods. And it also shows why there's a need for goods to undergo sufficient processing in one of the FTA member states in order for goods to qualify for the uh, preferential rates. Next slide, please. So just to, to um, show, you, show you this trade tariff lookup tool. So it's um, a tool that um, is within the government website and it allows traders to check import tariffs applicable to their goods. Um, and there's an option to choose the country that you will be importing from into Great Britain. Um, and there, 
there's a list of measures that will appear and the measure third country duty represents the UK MFN tariff rate and that's the default for goods coming from a third country where there's no free trade agreement or where goods don't meet the rules of origin or other conditions within that agreement and um, so traders are advised to check that the tool in advance um, and if the UK's MFN rate is already zero traders don't need to um, make use of um, or make a claim for preferential origin um, and there's a measure named tariff preference and that will show the duty rate applicable for goods it being imported under a free trade agreement and that won't always be zero it really depends on what has been um, agreed between the two countries as part of the negotiations um, for further information, you know, please refer to the Institute of Export and International Trade lunchtime learning webinars where we have gone into this in quite some detail. Next slide, please. Um, and rules of origin. Um, there's two concepts of rules of origin. There's non-preferential origin, and that identifies the econo economic nationality of a good and is used for the purposes of identifying the most favoured nation duty rate. And it also is used to apply trade re remedy measures, things like anti-dumping duty, and it can also determine where licenses might be needed. Um, and the UK has implemented it, its own set of non-preferential rules of origin, um, which are on the government website and were derived from those WTO rules that I mentioned. Um, and preferential origin um, identifies whether goods qualify for preferential tariffs under a free trade agreement um, and is applicable based on the rules set out in the free trade agreement text. And we'll go on to look at those now. So next slide, please, Will. Preferential rules of origin. So there's two concepts applicable. Um, goods that are wholly obtained, where goods are manufactured or originate entirely from countries covered under the free trade agreement, or goods that are worked or processed, which incorporate materials from third countries, and those goods need to meet product-specific rules of origin. Next slide, please. And those product-specific rules of origin um, are set out in the text of each individual free trade agreement by tariff heading. And it's important to define what, define what is meant when we say non-originating material. So non-originating material are those which are sourced from a third country or mater materials that do not qualify for preferential origin. So loosely, there's three concepts that apply. The value added rule, which limits, limits the value of non-originating materials. And traders will need to be able to quantify the total materials used and may need to hold supporting evidence that components are originating. There's the change of tariff classification rule, and that dictates that the final product cannot have the same tariff heading as any of the non-originating materials used in production. And lastly, there's specified processes, which are rules um, that are particular to certain specialised industries um, and the rules normally define specific non-originating materials that can be used or specific processes that need to have been undertaken. Um, and just worth mentioning that traders might have the choice of a rule which will be indicated by the word or um, or they might need to meet multiple rules in order for goods to qualify um, and that will be indicated by the word and. Okay. Next slide, please. So in addition to needing to meet rules of origin, there's a number of other conditions that need to be met in order for goods to qualify for preferential treatment. And without going through each one in detail, just to highlight a couple of the more important considerations, insufficient production. Uh, processing must go beyond operations listed as insufficient within the uh, free trade agreement. And that, that usually means that the processing that takes place needs to be to use special skills, machine or equipment, which have been specially um, installed to carry out manufacturing or processing. And if the goods don't undergo sufficient processing, they will not be considered originating and MFN duty rates will apply. Um, and just um, a second point, cumulation, I've already mentioned it. It's important to check the text of each individual agreement to check if cumulation is permitted and for goods originating in which countries. Um, so please refer to the Institute of Export and International Trade at Lunchtime Learning for further details on each of these considerations as well, as these have been covered at quite some length. Next slide, please, Will. 
Um, and just a few useful links. So the UK's trade agreements page, um, that will take you to the text of any UK free trade agreement that you need to access. Um, and the government have also developed a new tool, um, Check Duties and Customs Procedures for Exporting Goods. And it allows a user to input the commodity code for their goods and the destination country. And the, the tool will show you the duty rates applicable, the rules of origin and whether there's an FTA in place and any other relevant conditions. I've also included the link to the UK's Generalised Scheme of Pre Preferences page and the UK Trade Tariff Lookup tool, which will show you duty rates applicable um, to your goods. And um, with that, Will, I will hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And uh, with those links, we will um, obviously be sharing those uh, in the emails following this webinar. So yeah, we will we'll get you the full links um, there. But uh, just before we go into the Q&A, uh, as Amy mentioned, the Institute does have a, a suite of training courses and uh, lunchtime learning webinars, which are like these webinars, they go um, really in depth into specific topics like rules of origin or tariffs. Um, and we've done a load of them already around the trader, which have been recorded and accessible to our members. Uh, and we're running another series for regarding uh, the border operating model, which is controls on imports into the UK. So plenty of um, further information available. Just uh, go to export.org.uk to find out more about it. And um, if you're not already a member, then please do join, because that's, that's how you'll get the uh, optimal access to all of that information. So please do check out the website afterwards. Um, and as we go into the Q&A, once again, just going to uh, do the two-way thing where I'll ask you guys a couple of questions as well. Um, this poll is actually a two-parter, so we've got 10 options here. And um, the question is, which of these are the most important barriers to your company being able to do business overseas? Please select three of these. Um, and uh, just as, so we're going to ask this question again in a second, but this is kind of specific to your company. And the, the next one will be more around business environment general. And just a quick note to say that the answers to these polls, we are taking them to the government. Uh, they were, we're working, liaising with them to ask these particular questions. So it's a real opportunity to feedback to the government. While you are answering uh, these polls, a couple of questions. I'm going to put them to Jimena. Welcome, Jimena. Um, a debut on our webinar platform, of course. And uh, first question in from Fraser, who's asked, can you explain in a bit more detail uh, the rules around non-preferential origin? Sure. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. So as Amy was uh, pointing out, um, we have rules that apply when you are claiming a preferential uh, tariff under a free trade agreement, but there are some times where you are not claiming any preferential rule or there is no trade agreement that applies. So in that case, you have to refer to non-preferential rules of origin, which are those that we use um, or countries use to apply in when there is absence of any trade preference. That is, as Amy was saying, the MF, MFN uh, tariff. Now, how it works? Well, uh, every country that is trying to understand, okay, what is the origin of this non-preferential um, good? Uh, it could be, the way to find that origin could be one, the good is wholly obtained in a specific country, so it's been totally made in one country. Or sometimes the good is being made in different countries. So the origin will apply where the last substantial uh, process took place. So uh, where the last important stage of manufacture happened. So in that case, that will be the origin. If people want to find out uh, what are the non-preferential rules that apply uh, that a country use, uh, for example, uh, the UK non-preferential rules, you can go to the WTO website and you can find uh, the rules there, or you can go either to the government side, the UK government side, and you will find there the link where you can get the non-preferential tools. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, just going to quickly share the second of those questions. So this is the next five options. These ones are more 
lot around uh, business environment generally. Um, so yeah, really interesting on non-preferential uh, rules, obviously as ever, gov.uk does have a lot more information and uh, IOE training as well um, will we'll help in that. Another question though, just while people are answering the second part poll from Clive. Uh, Clive's asked, where can you check a production process for preference? Um, preference and yeah, sorry, that's the question I think. Right, uh, so sorry. in the government uh, in the UK, we have a tool that companies can use uh, and it's called the advanced origin ruling. So when a company is not sure uh, what are the rules applying, they can go to that uh, government website and request uh, and apply uh, an advanced ruling. Uh, for that, the government will require some information from the companies, but as long as the companies uh, provide that information, then the government will apply the advanced ruling, which is a binding decision from customs on the origin of the goods. Great stuff. And once again, we will be sharing links to uh, all these things in the follow-up. Uh, messaging. So just going to share the results to those two polls very quickly. Um, so the first one, uh, managing bureaucracy was the, the major um, barrier, 79% there. Uh, logistics is up there as well, 64%. And then uh, language, followed, followed by language, and then finance and credit insurance. And then if I quickly share the second of those. And uh, really interesting, uh, adaptation to post brexit circumstances, unsurprisingly, is uh, leading the way there, but also finding uh, trustworthy partners in overseas markets, competitive environment in overseas markets up there as well. So um, thank you everyone for answering. As, we, as I said, this will be being taken to government um, as part of our feedback and liaison with them. So um, thank you everyone once again for answering those polls. Back into the Q&A. Um, be great to bring back Yvonne now. Actually, we've had a few questions in around um, invoice financing, trade finance. There's actually, one here on Inca terms, which I'm always happy to ask an Inca terms question. So this is from uh, Sarah, who's asked, when working with the EU, I use FCA and the buyer arranged for collection and transportation of the goods. But my new US company, a customer, wants DDP to a distribution center and they don't think they have a particular choice in this matter. What what should they be doing uh, in that scenario? Yeah, they probably don't. And uh, DDP, particularly to some kind of distribution center in the US, particularly if their customer is um, a, a large organization, you know, may, like for example, you know, one of the supermarkets, um, they will have distribution centers, some of the larger clothing outlets will have distribution centers, and they like DDP. What you've got to be careful of if it's your first time changing terms from FCA to DDP is it's going to affect the price, because obviously you, the exporter, is the one that's going to be paying to ship those goods from the UK into the US. So that's something that uh, they really have to take into consideration. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, uh, and I, I, that, that's it. That, that, that really is the main consideration for our clients is not realising that it costs more to ship DDP than it does FCA. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, hearing in general that DDP seems to be not always the optimal one of FCA is often more recommended as, a, mm -hmm. as an Inca term. Um, which uh, seems to be the, the, the advice which we give the Institute as well. So that's really interesting. Um, a question from Tim for, uh, I'm going to put this to Amy. And Tim is asking, how do I prove the origin of goods from Vietnam um, into, uh, who, which are being moved into a customs warehouse in Belgium and then cooled down into smaller quantities in the UK? Well, it was a bit of a mouthful that one, but uh, what, what do you do there? Um, that's actually a good question. Um, well, and it's one that features quite a lot, not that specific, you know, not, not those specific countries, but given that the closeness of the UK with the EU geographically and the supply chain interlinkage, there has been quite an impact of the UK leaving the EU where goods are maybe sourced from an EU company that originally came from an FTA country. 
Um, so most free trade agreements state that goods cannot move through or be split in a third country. OK, that's that's kind of the default. But given the UK's ambition to reproduce the effects of those existing EU FTAs that I mentioned earlier, they actually have allowed goods to move through or be split in the EU in some agreements. Um, so as long as I think um, if that's allowed, um, it would say, you know, that the goods need to be held under customs supervision and cannot be altered in any way. So my advice would be to check the text of the agreement to find out whether that's permitted within the agreement. Thanks, Amy. Um, we're having a few questions in on Inca terms. Again, we haven't got all that much time, so I will kind of point people towards Inca terms to launch some learning we did recently. But um, thank you everyone for the questions. Anyhow, we've had another one just come in from Ian. Uh, he's asked, um, well, he said, I've had my first bad debts last year, but the credit insurer didn't pay out because I was out of time and these situations are not black and white. Uh, he was hoping to get the goods back, but that never happened. He was so disappointed. Um, he feels like credit insurance has, has let him down. Um, I guess he's he's asking kind of why should he be trusting in things like credit insurance? Uh, I've asked to Yvonne. Yeah, it's a, it's a good example of really reading your policy carefully and, and, and taking care to follow that policy. So when your usual chasing process expires, uh, you'd be looking to send some kind of pre-legal communication to the customer, even if you're still negotiating with the customer, for example, on return goods. And what you need to do is keep the trade credit insurer informed all the time. So every time you get correspondence from the customer or are uh, replying to the customer, make sure you pass copies over to the trade credit insurer. Make sure they're absolutely aware of what's going on. Because if you think you're doing the trade credit insurer a favor by trying to get the goods back, trying to minimize the loss, but you're not actually keeping them informed of what you're doing, then unfortunately, uh, I've seen that happen. Uh, and it, you know, the trade credit insurer won't uh, hesitate in saying you're out of time or actually haven't met the terms and conditions of your policy. So, um, yeah, they really, the terms need to be read carefully. And you really do need to keep them informed when you get to the back end of the uh, collection process. Thanks, Yvonne. I hope that's been uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, another question has just come in from um, Chris, who's asked, uh, this is again for you, Yvonne, uh, he's asked, how does Bibi interact with UK export finance? Uh, we talk a lot to UK export finance. We are not yet providing um, any of their products. The uh, working capital scheme or the new um, general exporter scheme, uh, we're not quite there yet, but we do hope it's something that we can look to for the future uh, to give additional support to our clients. But certainly we have a strong relationship with them, um, talk to them regularly, follow what's happening around the globe in terms of uh, trends. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, just had a couple of people asking, will the slides be shared afterwards? Yes, we will be sharing the slides um, after this webinar. Uh, a question for, uh, da, 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 I think I'll put this to Amy. Uh, this question from Michelle, I hope I've said that correctly, um, who's asked, where in a declaration do you indicate that you're using preferential trade? I'm sure that's probably a quite a big question, but kind of uh, in terms of declarations, how, how do they relate with, with origin? In terms of the cost, is it the customs declaration, Will? Uh, yes, yes, I think so. Uh, okay, so yeah, there's a specific way to claim preference on a customs declaration. Um, normally, it would be through use of the customs procedure code when you complete the import declaration. Um, and you would need to also indicate that you have evidence of the, the um, the origin on file from your supplier um, and then once that declaration is processed obviously a preferential duty rates would be applicable and duty wouldn't become payable. Great thank you I hope that's, uh, that's helped and I think we're starting to run out of time and on the questions so thank you everyone for the questions you've asked so far we'll, we'll do a couple more but I'm just going to do a quick poll uh, again, again, this is another two parter, so I'll keep on doing the questions during this. Uh, again, this is one which we're uh, doing with the government, uh, so it's asking which of these means of support should uh, government be prioritising for. 
businesses. And again, please pick three of those. Um, okay, and while you're answering that poll, uh, another question for, um, this time for Jimena. Can you explain what we mean by provisionally applied free trade agreements? Sorry, could you please repeat? Can you explain further what uh, what we mean by provisionally applied free, free trade agreements? Provision of free trade agreements? Yeah. Provisionally applied, yep. I can take that well if you like. Yeah, yeah I'll take, I'll take okay. the free trade agreements. I hear um, properly. No, that's fine. Don't worry. Um, so free trade agreements need to undergo a full legal ratification process by both members um, of the agreement. And where that won't be done in time, um, especially for the UK, given the short time frame in which they've signed all of these agreements, the UK has, has um, put an agreement in place where the, the agreement can provisionally apply through um, bridging mechanisms or provisional application. And that enables countries to apply the treaty commitments um, on a provisional provisional basis prior into that legal entry into force. Okay. So, so I think the effect is the same. Um, it's just that it's provisional application because it hasn't been legally ratified by both parties. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm just going to ask for the second part of that question. And we've had another question which has come through. Um, this is about electronic GSP certificates. Um, are they issued in countries such as India and are they valid for imports into the UK? Uh, Amy, do you want to take that one on? That's from Isabel. Sure. Um, so um, goods that meet the UK GSP rules of all origin um, are eligible to claim GSP um, as long as there's a valid um, evidence on file. So um, the, from memory, the evidence can be, I think the UK has implemented a new um, form called a GSP Form A, um, and that can be a copy, um, or an origin declaration can be used. Um, and I think the uh, UK government have also said that they will accept those REC statements, which were the EU-based evidence of origin um, for the rest of this year. Great, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, and just while people, so I mean, just while people are finishing answering that poll, uh, thank you once again uh, to Amy and uh, Jimena from the IRE and to Yvonne from Bibi uh, for answering everyone's questions today and um, for the presentations as well. I hope everyone has found that uh, useful. Um, it's also been a pleasure once again to present to you. And uh, as noted earlier, we will be sharing the slides from today's webinar in the follow-up to this webinar. Um, I'll quickly close the poll and very quickly share the results from it. Um, so if I quickly share the first part. So 83% uh, are looking for more online systems for customs and 61% are looking for support for due diligence, but leading the way is support for staff to train and export processes. Uh, actually, it's not quite in a way, but it's it's up there as well. So um, basically, desire for more support on kind of customs and export processes, and uh, we can send more information about actually some grant funding the government is providing towards um, advice and training in uh, the new processes around trade. Um, again, that can go towards institute training courses as well. So that's a, another good opportunity. And then the last poll. Uh, yep, the government, uh, the people, the, the audience today want more trade deals in new markets. Unsurprisingly, they, as Amy has uh, indicated already, they do present lots of opportunities in terms of tariffs, but also a, a lot of you looking for, for more tax breaks for exporters. So um, that's really interesting feedback. And thank you everyone for answering that. That's been really, really useful. So thank you once again. And on that note, uh, I'm going to wrap up for today. Thank you to our speakers once again, and uh, I wish you all a lovely Easter weekend, and I look forward to speaking to you on the next webinar. But for now, goodbye, everyone. Thank you.